Chapter Fifteen of the Fundamental Doctrines of the Christian Faith by R. A. Torrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Fifteen: Is Future Punishment Everlasting? Jesus Christ plainly taught that there was to be a literal hell, and that this hell would be a place of conscious suffering, suffering far beyond that experienced by any one here in this present life. But we are faced by another question of great importance is this future conscious suffering of the impenitent to be endless there are many who believe in future punishment of a very severe and awful character and who indeed believe in a literal hell of awful conscious suffering but they deny or at least doubt that this future hell will be a place of endless conscious suffering many of them admit and teach that the suffering may go on for a long time and perhaps for thousands of years but they hold that it will end at last, and that all men will ultimately come to repentance, accept Jesus Christ, and be saved. What is the exact truth about this matter? We cannot decide this by asking what the majority of supposedly reliable theologians believe, for majorities are often wrong, and minorities are often right. Neither can we decide it by reasoning as to what a being such as God is must do. It is impossible for finite and foolish men such as we are, and such as the wisest philosophers and theologians are, to judge what an infinitely wise and infinitely holy God must do. All reasonings by finite men as to what an infinitely wise God must do are utterly futile, and an utter waste of time. All we know about the future is what God has been pleased to tell us in his word. The Bible, as we have seen, is beyond a question the word of God, and therefore what it has to say on this subject, or any other subject, is true and absolutely sure, and, in a question of this character, one ounce of God's revelation is worth more than a thousand tons of man's speculation. The whole question, then, is, what does the Bible teach in regard to this matter? To find out exactly what the Bible teaches as to the endlessness of future punishment, let us turn, first of all, to the words of our Lord Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, Revised Version. And these shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The first question that confronts us in studying this passage is what the word Ionois, Ionoian, which is here translated eternal, means. The best Greek-English dictionary of the New Testament is Thayer's. In this dictionary, Thayer, after careful study of the word, its derivation and its usage, gives these three definitions of the word, and these three only. 1. Without beginning or end, that which always has been and always will be. 2 without beginning, three, without end, never to cease, everlasting. It is frequently said that the word aeoneus, according to its derivation, means age-lasting, and therefore may refer to a limited period. Even admitting this to be true, we should bear in mind that the meaning of words is not determined by their derivations, but by their usage, and the most important question is not what the derivation of this word may be, but as to how it is used in the New Testament. It is used 72 times in the New Testament. 44 of these 72 times it is used in the phrase eternal life, or as it is sometimes rendered, everlasting life. No one questions that everlasting life is endless, and that in connection with the word life, age lasting, if that be its proper definition of the word, means lasting through all ages, never ending. Once it is used in connection with the word habitations, referring to the habitations which the blessed are to have in the world to come, and, of course, these also are never-ending. Once it is used of the weight of glory, that in the world to come awaits the believer in Jesus Christ who endures affliction for Christ in the life that is now. In this case again, of course, by universal consent, it means endless. Once it is used in the house not made with hands that believers in Christ are to receive at the coming of the Lord Jesus, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-8. to Of course, this house not made with hands is everlasting. In fact, the very point that is being brought forward in this passage is the contrast between our present bodies, which are but for a brief time, and our resurrection bodies, which are to exist throughout all eternity. Once it is used of the future unseen things that never end, contrasted with the present seen things that are for a season. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Of course, these are never ending. This is the very point that is being brought out in the contrast. Once it is used of the everlasting comfort, revised version, or consolation, authorized version, 
that our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father give us, and that is certainly never-ending. Twice it is used of the glory that those in Christ obtain, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. That, of course, by universal consent, is endless. Once it is used of the salvation Christ brings, which is beyond question never-ending. Once, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, it is used of the redemption that Jesus Christ secures for us by his blood. This redemption is never-ending. In fact, the chief point of contrast in the context in this case is between the temporary redemption secured by the constantly repeated sacrifices of the Mosaic ritual and the never-ending redemption secured by the perfect sacrifice of Christ made once for all. Once it is used of the inheritance that those who are in Christ receive, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Here again, beyond a question, it is never-ending. Once it is used of the everlasting covenant through Christ's blood contrasted with the temporary covenant based on the blood of bulls and goats given through Moses. Here again, it necessarily and emphatically means never ending. That is the very point at issue. Once it is used of the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 11, and we are told in Luke chapter 1, verse 33, of his kingdom there shall be no end. Once it is used of everlasting gospel, or good news, and that, of course, also never ends. Once it is used of the everlasting God, Romans chapter 16, verse 26, and he certainly endures not merely through long ages, but without end. Once it is used of the Holy Spirit, who is called the eternal or everlasting spirit, and he certainly endures not merely through long ages, but throughout an absolute endless eternity. This covers 59 of the 72 times it is used, and in these 59 instances the thought of endlessness is absolutely necessary to the sense, and not in a single one of the 13 remaining times where it is used, is it used of anything that is known to end. If usage can determine the meaning of any word, then certainly the New Testament usage of this word determines it to mean never-ending, or as Thayer defines it, without end, never to cease, everlasting. Nor is this all. God himself determines it to mean never-ending. He defines it to mean never-ending by specifically using it in contrast with that which does end. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, we read, While we look not on the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporal, literally for a season, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here the whole point is that the unseen things, in distinction from the seen which are for a season, are for a never-ending duration. But even allowing that the word according to its usage could be used of that which, though it lasts throughout an age or ages, has an end, even if that were true, which it is not, then the meaning of the word in any given instance would have to be determined by the context in which it is found. Now, what is the context in the passage which we are studying? Let us read it again. And these shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The same Greek adjective is used in connection with punishment and with life. In the authorized version, it is differently rendered, but in the Greek and in the revised version, it is exactly the same. Certainly, this qualifying adjective must mean the same in one half of the sentence that it means in the other half of the sentence. We must at least admit that Jesus Christ was an honest man, and he certainly was too honest to juggle with words. He would not use a word to mean one thing in one half of a sentence and something utterly different in the other half. He evidently sought to convey the impression that the punishment of the unsaved was of the same duration as the life of the saved. No one questions that the life is endless. It would be the destruction of all of our hopes if it were not endless. Therefore, if we are to deal honestly with our Lord's words, he taught that the punishment of the unsaved was to be endless. We have exactly the same reason in God's word for believing in endless punishment that we have for believing in endless life. If you give up the one, you must give up the other, or else deal dishonestly with the words of Jesus Christ. We might rest the case here and call it proven, but let us turn to another passage, Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a great voice, If any man worshipeth the beast and his image, and receiveth a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his anger, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goeth up for ever and ever. And they shall have no rest day and night, they that worship the beast and his image, and whoso receiveth the mark of his name. Here we have another expression for the duration of the punishment and suffering of the impenitent. 
the expression rendered for ever and ever there are in the greek two slightly differing forms of expression that are so translated the one form of expression literally rendered is unto the ages of the ages the other form is unto ages of ages what thought do these expressions convey it has been said by those who seek to escape the force of these words as referring to absolute endlessness that the expression is a hebraism for the supreme one of its class and as an illustration of the same alleged hebraism the expression lord of lords and holy of holies are cited but this is not so in the first place the form of neither of the two expressions is the same and in the second place that is not the meaning of the expression lord of lords or the meaning of the expression the holy of holies the expression lord of lords does not mean merely the supreme lord but the one who is himself lord of all other lords and the expression unto the ages of the ages never means merely the ages which are the supreme ages in distinction from other ages nor as another puts it the ages which come out of the other ages i e the closing ages before eternity the expression according to its form means ages which are themselves composed of ages it represents not years tumbling upon years nor centuries tumbling upon centuries but ages tumbling upon ages in endless procession it is the strongest possible form of expression for absolute endlessness furthermore the way to determine conclusively what the expression means is by considering its usage usage is always the decisive thing in determining the meaning of words and phrases what is the usage of these expressions in the book from which we have taken our passage these expressions are used twelve times in this book in eight of the twelve times they refer to the duration of the existence or reign or glory of god and his son jesus christ our lord of course in these instances it must stand not merely for the supreme ages or any individual ages it must refer to absolute eternity and endlessness once it is used of the duration of the blessed reign of the righteous and of course here again it refers to an endless eternity and in the three remaining instances it is used of the duration of the torment of the devil the beast the false prophet and the finally impenitent it is urged by those who would deny that the expression means an absolute endless eternity that it is used in revelation chapter 10 verse 15 where we are told that the kingdom of the world is become the kingdom of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign for ever and ever unto the ages of the ages and we are told in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 24 that christ shall deliver up the kingdom to god even the father and that therefore his kingdom must come to an end and consequently for ever and ever in this passage cannot mean without end there are two answers to this objection either of which is sufficient the first is that the he in he shall reign for ever and ever in revelation chapter eleven verse fifteen does not necessarily refer to the christ but rather to the lord jehovah in which case the argument falls to the ground the second answer is that while we are taught in first corinthians chapter fifteen verse twenty four etc that jesus christ will deliver up his mediatorial kingdom to the father nevertheless we are distinctly taught that he shall rule with the father and we are told in so many words in luke chapter one verse thirty three that of his kingdom there shall be no end so that even if the he in revelation chapter eleven verse fifteen referred to christ and not to the lord jehovah still the statement would be exactly correct that he the christ was to reign for ever and ever that is without end there is not a single passage in the whole book in which this expression is used of anything but that which is absolutely endless so the question is answered again and answered decisively that the conscious suffering of the persistently impenitent is absolutely endless now let us look at another passage second thessalonians chapter one verses seven to nine the lord jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not god and that obey not the gospel of our lord jesus christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the lord and from the glory of his power here we are told that the punishment of those that know not god and obey not the gospel is everlasting destruction what does everlasting destruction mean in revelation chapter 17 verses 8 and 11 we are told that the beast goeth into destruction so if we can find out where the beast goes or into what he goes we shall know what destruction means in the bible usage in revelation chapter 19 verse 20 we are told that the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought the signs in his sight wherewith he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image they too were cast alive into the lake of fire that burneth with brimstone so we see that destruction 
is a portion of the lake of fire and in the next chapter revelation chapter 20 verse 10 we are told that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where also are the beast and the false prophet after having already been there for one thousand years see context and they shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever so we see that destruction means a portion of the lake of fire where its inhabitants are consciously suffering without cessation for ever and ever it is clear then from a comparison of second thessalonians chapter one verses seven to nine with these passages that those who know not god and obey not the gospel of our lord jesus christ shall be punished with never-ending conscious suffering let us look at one more passage matthew chapter 25 verse 41 these again are the words of the lord jesus himself then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels what i wish you to notice here is that the punishment into which the impenitent are sent is the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels we have an exact description of just what the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels is in the passage read a few moments ago revelation chapter 20 verse 10 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where also the beast and the false prophet and they shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever by comparison of these two statements we have another explicit declaration of our lord that the punishment of the impenitent is to be a conscious agony where they are punished without rest day and night for ever and ever from any one of these passages and especially from all of them taken together it is clear that the scriptures make it as plain as language can make it that the future punishment of the persistently impenitent is absolutely endless there are several passages of scripture which those who believe that all men will ultimately repent and be brought to accept christ and thus saved urge against what seems to be the plain teaching of the passages we have been studying the first of these is first peter chapter 3 verses 18 to 20 because christ also suffered for sins once the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison that aforetime were disobedient when the long suffering of god waited in the days of noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved through water it is urged that as christ went and preached to the spirits in prison there will be another chance after men have died but this the passage in question does not assert or imply in any way first of all there is no proof that the spirits in prison refers to the departed spirits of men who once lived here on earth in the bible departed spirits of men are not spoken of in this way these words are used of other spirits but not of human spirits disembodied and there is every reason for supposing that these spirits in prison were not the sinful men that were on earth when the ark was preparing but the angels who sinned at that time just as we are told in genesis chapter six verses one and two that they did sin compare jude verses six and seven furthermore even if the spirits in prison here spoken of were the spirits of men who were disobedient in the time of noah there is not a hint in the passage that they were saved through the preaching of christ to them or that they had another chance there are two words commonly used in the new testament for preaching one is caruso and the other is eugalizo the first of these means to herald as to herald a king or to herald the kingdom it may however be used of preaching a message the gospel message or some other message the second word ugalizo means to preach the gospel in the passage that we are studying it is the first word that is used and there is not a hint that christ preached the gospel to these spirits in prison he simply heralded the triumph of the kingdom it was not a saving message so there is nothing in this passage to put up even inferentially against the plain direct statements regarding the destiny of the wicked found in the passages we have been studying the second passage that is appealed to by those who deny the endlessness of future punishment is philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to 11 wherefore also god highly exalted him and gave unto him the name which is above every name that in the name of jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of the father here it is said we are told that those under the earth as well as in heaven and on earth should bow the knee in the name of jesus and confess that jesus is lord and that this implies that they are saved 
but it does not imply that they are saved. Every knee of lost men, and of the devil, and his angels, too, will be forced some day to bow in the name of Jesus, and every tongue forced to confess that he is Lord. If any one does that in this present life of his own free choice, he will be saved, but otherwise he will do it by compulsion in the age to come, and every one has his choice between doing it now willingly and gladly and being saved, or doing it by compulsion hereafter and being lost. There is absolutely nothing in this passage to teach universal salvation or to militate, even inferentially, against the plain statements we have been studying. The third passage that is appealed to is Acts chapter 3, verses 19-21. to 21. Repent ye therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, so that there may come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who hath been appointed for you, even Jesus, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restoration of all things whereof God spake by the mouth of his holy prophets that have been from of old. Here we are told of a coming restoration of all things, and those who contend for the doctrine of universal salvation hold that this means the restoration to righteousness of all persons. But that is not what it says, and that is not what it refers to. We are taught in Old Testament prophecy and also in the book of Romans that in connection with the return of our Lord Jesus there is to be a restoration of all nature, of the whole physical universe, from its fallen state. For example, in Romans chapter 8 verses 19 to 21 we read, For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. And in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 13 we read, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to Jehovah for a name, for an everlasting sign, that shall not be cut off. And in Isaiah chapter 65 verse 25 we are told, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith Jehovah. And in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 15, we are told that, Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness become a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest. It is to this restoration of the physical universe, here plainly predicted in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 21, and these Old Testament prophecies, that the restoration of all things spoken of in Acts chapter 3 verse 21 refers. There is not a hint, not the slightest suggestion, of a restoration of impenitent sinners. Still another passage that is urged is Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10, where we read, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him unto a dispensation of the fullness of the times, to sum up all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth. Here it is urged that things in heaven and things in earth are to be summed up in Christ. This is true, but it should be noticed that the Holy Spirit has specifically omitted here the phrase that is found in Philippians chapter 2 verse 10, the things under the earth, that is the abode of the lost. So this passage, so far from suggesting that the lost ones in hell will be restored, suggests exactly the opposite thing. There is then certainly nothing in this passage to militate even inferentially against the plain statements we have been studying. One more passage that is urged against the doctrine we have been studying remains to be considered. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. Here we read, For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. It is urged in connection with this passage that we are distinctly told here that all who die in Adam, that is, every human being, shall be made alive in Christ, and that made alive means obtain eternal life, or be saved. For years I thought that this was the true interpretation of this passage, and for that reason in part I held and preached at that time that all men ultimately, sometime, somewhere, somehow, would be brought to accept Jesus Christ and be saved. But when I came to study the passage more carefully, I saw that this was a misinterpretation of the passage. Every passage in the Bible or in any other book must be interpreted in its context. The whole subject that Paul is talking about in this chapter is not eternal life, not the immortality of the soul, but the resurrection of the body. And all this passage declares is that, as all lose physical life in Adam, so also all will obtain resurrection of the body in Christ. 
whether that resurrection of the body is a resurrection to everlasting life or a resurrection to shame and everlasting contempt, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, depends entirely upon what men do with the Christ in whom they get it. There is absolutely nothing here to teach universal salvation. It only teaches a universal resurrection, resurrection of the wicked as well as of the righteous. To sum up the teachings of all these passages that are so often urged to prove universal salvation, there is nothing in any one of the passages, nor in all of them together, to teach that all men will ultimately be saved, and there is nothing in them to in any way conflict with what we have seen to be the honest meaning of the passages studied above, namely, that the future punishment of sin is absolutely endless. There is not a passage to be found in the Bible that teaches universal salvation, or that all men will ultimately come to repentance and be saved. I wish that there were, but there is not. I have been searching diligently for such a passage for nearly forty years, and I have not found it, and it cannot be found. There remains one other important question, and that is, where are the issues of eternity settled? There are those who believe that the punishment of the persistently impenitent is everlasting, that it has no end, but they also believe that the issues of eternity are not settled in the life that is now, but that with many they are settled after death, and that when men die impenitent they will have another chance. Believing in endless punishment does not necessarily involve believing that there is no chance after death. There are many who believe that there will be a chance after death, and that many will accept it, who also believe that some will not accept it and will therefore be punished for ever and ever. Now what is the teaching of the Word of God on this point? Let me call your attention to four passages, any one of which settles the question, and taken together they leave no possible room for doubt for any candid man who is willing to take the Bible as meaning what it says, any man who is really trying to find out what the Bible teaches and not merely trying to support a theory. The first passage is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive things done in the body, according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. In this passage we are plainly told that the basis of judgment in the world to come is the things done in the body, that is, the things done this side of the grave, the things done before we shuffle off this mortal coil, the things done before the spirit leaves the body. Of course, this particular passage has to do primarily with the judgment of the believer, but it shows what the basis of future judgment is, viz., the things done the side of the grave. The second passage is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this cometh judgment. Here we are distinctly told that after death there is to be not an opportunity to prepare for judgment, but judgment, and that, therefore, our destiny is settled at death, and that there is no chance of salvation after death. The third passage is John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in the tombs shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. Here also it is clearly implied that the resurrection of good and bad is for the purpose of judgment, regarding the things done before their bodies were laid in their graves. A fourth passage, if possible more decisive than any of these, gives our Lord's words, John chapter 8, verse 21. He said, Therefore again unto them, I go away, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sin, whither I go, ye cannot come. Here our Lord distinctly declares that the question whether men shall come to be with him or not depends on what they do before they die, that if they die impenitent, if they die in their sins, that whither he goes they cannot come. To sum up the teaching of all these passages, the issues of eternity, the issues of eternal life or eternal destruction, the issues of eternal blessedness and glory, or eternal agony and shame, are settled in the life that now is. The future state of those who reject in the life that now is the redemption offered to them in Jesus Christ is plainly declared in the word of God to be a state of conscious, unutterable, endless torment and anguish. This conception is an appalling one, but it is the scriptural conception. It is the unmistakable, inescapable teaching of God's own word. I wish that all men would repent and accept Christ. If anyone could show me one single passage in the Bible that clearly taught that all men would ultimately repent, accept Christ, and be saved, it would be the happiest day of my life. But it cannot be found. I once thought it could, and so I believed and taught. These ideas, 
so widely noised about to-day as something new these theories of pastor russell formerly of pittsburgh mr gelisnoff of this city dr maybe of long beach mr pridgen of pittsburgh and many others are not at all new to me i held and taught substantially the same views regarding ultimate universal salvation years before these men were heard of indeed nearly forty years ago i was familiar with the arguments that they now urge and other arguments which they do not seem to know but which were to me more decisive than those that they urge but the time came as i studied the bible more carefully when i could not reconcile my teaching with what i found to be the unmistakable teaching of god's word i had to do one of three things i had to either give up my belief that the bible was the word of god or else i must twist the words of jesus and others in the new testament to mean something else than what they clearly appeared to teach or else i must give up my doctrine of ultimate universal restoration and salvation i could not give up my faith that the bible was the word of god for i had found absolutely overwhelming proof that it was god's word i could not twist the words of jesus and of others to mean something else than what was clearly their intended meaning for i was an honest man there was only one thing left to do and that was to give up my doctrine of universal restoration and salvation i gave it up with great reluctance but i was compelled to give it up or to be untrue to my own reason and conscience it is the inescapable teaching of the word of god that all who go out of this world without having accepted jesus christ will spend eternity in hell in a hell of unutterable conscious anguish the bible conception is also a reasonable one when we come to see the appalling nature of sin and especially the appalling nature of the sin of trampling underfoot god's mercy towards sinners and rejecting god's glorious son whom in his love he has provided as a savior shallow views of sin and of god's holiness and of the glory of jesus christ lie at the bottom of weak theories of the doom of the impenitent when we see sin in all its hideousness and enormity the holiness of god in all its perfection and the glory of jesus christ in all its infinity nothing but a doctrine that those who persist in the choice of sin who love darkness rather than light and who persist in the rejection of the son of god shall endure everlasting anguish will satisfy the demands of our own moral intuitions nothing but the fact that we dread suffering more than we loathe sin and more than we love the glory of jesus christ makes us repudiate the thought that beings who eternally choose sin should eternally suffer or that men who despise god's mercy and spurn his son should be given over to endless anguish if after men have sinned and god still offers them mercy and makes the tremendous sacrifice of his son to save them if they still despise that mercy and trample god's son under foot if then they are consigned to everlasting torment i cannot but say amen alleluia true and righteous are thy judgments o lord at all events the doctrine of conscious eternal torment for impenitent men is clearly revealed in the word of god and whether we can defend it on philosophical grounds or not it is our business to believe it and leave it to the clearer light of eternity to explain what we cannot now understand realizing that god may have many infinitely wise reasons for doing things for which we in our ignorance can see no sufficient reason at all it is the most ludicrous conceit for beings so limited and foolish as the wisest of men are to attempt to dogmatize how a god of infinite wisdom must act all we know as to how god is to act is what god has seen fit to tell us in conclusion two things are certain first the more closely men walk with god and the more devoted they become in his service the more likely they are to believe this doctrine many there are who tell us they love their fellow men too much to believe this doctrine but the men who show their love in more practical ways than by sentimental protestations about it the men who show their love for their fellow man as jesus christ showed his by laying down their lives for them they believe this doctrine even as jesus christ himself believed it as christians become worldly and easy-going they grow loose in their doctrine concerning the doom of the impenitent the fact that loose doctrines are spreading so rapidly and widely in our day is nothing for them but against them for worldliness is also spreading in the church first timothy chapter four verse one second timothy chapter three verse one and chapter four verses two and three increasing laxity of life and increasing laxity of doctrine go arm in arm second men who accept a loose doctrine regarding the ultimate penalty of sin be it universalism restorationism annihilationism or that fantastic combination or conglomeration of them all millennial dawnism 
lose their power for God. I have seen this proven over and over again. These men may be, and are very clever at argument, and very zealous in proselytizing, but they are seldom found beseeching men to be reconciled to God. They are more likely to be found, trying to upset the faith of those already won by the efforts of those who do believe in everlasting punishment, than trying to win men who have no faith at all. If you really believe the doctrine of the endless torment of the impenitent, if the doctrine really gets hold of you, you will work as you never worked before for the salvation of the lost. If you in any wise abate the doctrine, it will abate your zeal. Time and time again I have come to this awful doctrine and tried to find some way of escape from it. But when I have failed, as I always have failed at last, when I have determined to be honest with the Bible and myself, I have returned to my work with an increased burden for souls and an intensified determination to spend and be spent for their salvation. Eternal, conscious suffering, suffering without the least ray of hope, of relief, awaits every one of you here tonight who goes on persistently rejecting Jesus Christ as you are rejecting him tonight, and who shall pass out of this world having rejected him. In that world of never-ending gloom there will be no possibility of repentance. As you look out into the future, there will be not one single ray of hope. Forever and ever will be the unceasing wail of that restless sea of fire. After you have been there ten million years and look out to the future, you will see eternity still stretching on and on and on and on with no hope. Oh, men and women out of Christ, why will you risk such a doom for a single year? or a month, or a week, or a day. Hell is too awful to risk for five minutes the chance of going there. There is but one rational thing for you to do. That is to accept Christ, and to accept Him right now as your Savior. Surrender to Him as your Lord and Master. Confess Him as such before the world, and strive from this time on to please Him in everything day by day. Any other course is utter madness. End of chapter 15. And end of The Fundamental Doctrines of the Christian Faith by R. A. Torrey. Read by Marianne Spiegel in Chicago, Illinois. August 2017.